on The Hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Dan Novak. And I'm Dan Friedel. This program is designed for English learners. So we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases, especially written for people learning English. Coming up on the program, Gina Bennett reports on why women across Iceland have gone on strike. John Russell has a story on publishing companies that are getting increasingly concerned about generative AI. Dan Novak has this week's education report about a growing number of financial literacy courses in American schools. Later, Dan and John return for the lesson of the day. But first... Iceland's Prime Minister and women across the island nation went on strike Tuesday. They are pushing for an end to unequal pay and gender-based violence. Icelanders awoke to all-male news teams announcing shutdowns across the nation. Schools closed down, public transportation was delayed, hospitals had fewer workers, and hotel rooms went uncleaned. Katrín Jakobsdóttir is Iceland's prime minister. She said that she would stay home as part of the women's strike and expected other women on her cabinet to do the same. Iceland's trade unions are the main organizers of the strike. They called on women and non-binary, a term to describe those who do not identify as male or female, to strike. They refused to do both paid and unpaid work, including household work, for the day. About 90% of Icelandic workers belong to a union. Schools and the health system, which have large female workforces, said they would be heavily affected by the walkout. National broadcaster RUV said it was reducing television and radio broadcasts for the day. Tuesday's walkout lasts from midnight to midnight. It is called the biggest strike since Iceland's first such event on October 24, 1975. That was when 90% of women refused to work, clean, or look after children to express anger at discrimination in the workplace. In 1976, Iceland passed a law guaranteeing equal rights of men and women. Since then, there have been several partial day strikes. The most recent one came in 2018 with women walking off the job in the early afternoon. That represented the time of day when women, on average, stop earning compared to men. Iceland is a country of about 380,000 people. It sits just below the Arctic Circle in the North Atlantic Ocean. It has been ranked as the world's most gender-equal country 14 years straight by the World Economic Forum, which measures pay, education, health care, among others. 
no country has reached full equality, and there remains a gender pay gap in Iceland. We have not yet reached our goals of full gender equality, and we are still tackling the gender-based wage gap, which is unacceptable in 2023, the Prime Minister said. The cabinet is evenly split between male and female ministers. Nearly half of lawmakers in Iceland's parliament are women. Many women in Iceland are in high-paying and powerful positions. But the lowest-paying jobs, such as cleaning and childcare, are still mostly done by women. The work is very important for Iceland's tourism economy. It also depends heavily on immigrants, who largely work longer hours and take home the lowest pay. Around 22% of the female workforce is foreign-born, found Statistics Iceland. Large parts of the center of the capital, Reykjavik, will be closed to traffic ahead of a protest on Tuesday afternoon. Protest signs posted on social media before the event hit back at the idea that Iceland is already perfect for women with the slogan, You Call This Gender Equality? Iceland's 1975 strike led to similar protests in other countries, including Poland. There, women boycotted jobs and classes in 2016 to protest a proposed abortion ban. In Spain, women struck for 24 hours in 2018. The country's major unions estimated that 5.3 million people joined the strike. I'm Gina Bennett. Publishing companies are growing increasingly concerned about generative AI, especially a model developed by Google. Since May, Google has begun releasing a new form of search in the United States, India, and Japan, powered by generative AI. The product is called Search Generative Experience, or SGE. SGE uses AI to create summaries for some search questions. Google says those summaries appear on the top of the Google Search homepage with links to Dig Deeper. If publishers want to prevent their content from being used by Google's AI to create those summaries, they must use the same tool that would prevent them from appearing in Google search results. That would make it difficult for people using search to find the publishers that choose not to be involved in SGE. Google says that the AI-generated summaries are put together from many web pages, and that the links are designed to be a starting point to learn more. The company describes SGE as an opt-in experiment for users who will help develop and improve the product. To publishers, however, the new search tool is the latest concern in an unusual relationship. Publishers both compete against Google for online advertising and depend on the company for search traffic.
Four major publishers spoke to Reuters news agency recently. The businesses said they are trying to understand their place in a world where AI could control how users find and pay for information. The publishers asked not to be identified because of ongoing negotiations with Google. Publisher concerns relate to a number of issues. They include the issue of web traffic, whether publishers will be credited as the providers of information that appears in the SGE summaries, and whether those summaries are correct. Most importantly, publishers want to be paid for the content on which Google and other AI companies train their AI tools. A Google spokesperson said in a statement, As we bring generative AI into search, we're continuing to prioritize approaches that send valuable traffic to a wide range of creators, including news publishers, to support a healthy open web. On the issue of payments, Google said it is developing a better understanding of the business of generative AI applications and getting opinions from publishers and others. In late September, Google announced a new tool called Google Extended. It gives publishers the choice to block their content from being used by Google to train its AI models. Giving publishers the choice to not be used for AI is a good-faith gesture, said Danielle Coffey, president and chief executive of the News Media Alliance, an industry trade group. Whether payments will follow is a question mark, and to what extent there is openness to having a healthier value exchange, Coffey added. The new tool does not permit publishers to block their content from being used for SGE without disappearing from traditional Google search. Publishers want evidence that people are using their websites to secure advertisers. Showing up in Google search is important to their business. The design for SGE has pushed the links that appear in traditional search further down the web page. That might reduce traffic to those links by as much as 40%, said an official at one of the publishers. More worrying is the possibility that people searching the web will avoid clicking any of the links if the SGE passage meets the user's need for information. Nikhil Lay is an expert with Forrester Research, a company based in Cambridge, Massachusetts. He said SGE is definitely going to decrease publishers' traffic, and they're going to have to think about a different way to measure the value of that content, if not click-through rate. Even so, he believes publishers will remain trusted because their links will appear in SGE. I'm John Russell. increasing number of American states are requiring that students receive personal finance education in order to complete high school. At the same time, states are hoping to improve math skills among students in the United States. Capital City Public Charter School in Washington, D.C. has a course called Advanced Algebra with Financial Applications. The school has offered the math class for more than 10 years. The class provides students with basic knowledge about money management and helps them sharpen their math skills. 
classes discuss credit, investments, and loans, for example, and connect these ideas with methods of math for calculating interest, budgeting, and more. The high school may be a leader in providing financial education, but in recent years, many others have offered similar courses. Since 2020, nine U.S. states have passed laws or policies requiring schools to provide personal finance education before students can graduate from high school. The U.S. nonprofit organization. Council for Economic Education says 30 states now have such policies in place. The increase comes as educators are trying to improve students' math skills, which dropped during the pandemic and have not fully recovered. At the same time, a general dislike or disinterest for math remains a barrier among young people. Tanika Tatum Gomez teaches the course at the Washington School. She said students get more interested in math when they see how it connects with their future financial well-being. Students begin to understand that yes, I need to learn decimals, and I need to learn fractions, and I need to learn percentages, because I have to manage my money. And I have to take out a loan, Tatum Gomez said. Supporters say personal finance courses help students learn how to make smart money decisions, and develop an interest in math as a result. The Council for Economic Education says financial education should include exploring subjects like earning, budgeting. Saving, investing, and managing credit and financial risk. Experts say the class does not have to be taught by a traditional math teacher. Idaho is one of the states where a new financial literacy requirement is in place. The new program will give students the chance to use skills from their algebra, calculus. And economics classes in real life. In the class, they will calculate their future student loans, rent payments, and income requirements. Experts say the 2007-2008 financial crisis, pandemic-linked economic insecurity, and current high inflation may have increased Americans' desire for stronger financial knowledge. Less than one fourth of millennials show basic financial literacy. The Council for Economic Education says. In 2020, the American Civil Rights Group (NAACP) released a resolution calling for more financial literacy programs in K-12 schools. A study by the nonprofit Next Gen Personal Finance Schools. Looked at states without high school financial literacy requirements. It found that in schools with mainly Black and Hispanic students' populations, only seven percent of students have access to a half school year personal finance course. That figure rises to fourteen point two percent for schools with less than a quarter of students identifying as Black or Hispanic. That lack of fairness is a driving force behind the financial literacy course at Capital City Public Charter School. It serves a student population that is 64% Latino and 25% Black. It's an empowering course, says Lena Cox, head of the school. I think it gives our young people the language that they need. And the voice when they're in certain rooms and at certain tables. Dan Novak joins me now. 
to talk more about today's education story. Welcome, Dan. Thanks again for having me. Today's story was about the increase in personal finance courses in American schools. The hope is that these kinds of courses increase students' knowledge about finance, as well as get them more interested in math. What sorts of things are students learning from these courses? The Council for Economic Education says financial education should include topics like earning, budgeting, saving, investing, and managing credit and financial risk. Supporters of such courses say the more math involved, the better. The hope is that by applying certain math skills to students' everyday lives, it'll help them get more excited about math. What is an example of a lesson in a personal finance course that involves math? One teacher interviewed by the AP for the story was Tanika Tatum Gormez. She described a lesson in her class that I didn't have time to get to in the story. So in her class, she had a discussion about personal savings. Then she asked students to calculate how much someone would need to save to create an emergency fund covering three months' worth of expenses. Another example of a lesson that I'm making up is having students calculate the return on investment of a 10-year bond with a 1% interest rate. So there's a lot of ways to include math and personal finance, and experts say the class doesn't even need to be taught by a traditional math teacher. Well, Dan... Let's hope that those interest rates come back sometime soon. Thanks again for joining me, Dan. In this next report, you will hear John Russell tell us about Europe's electric vehicle industry. We learn that European officials are growing concerned about the success of Chinese EV makers in Europe's car market. Pay careful attention to the word features. We will talk more about it after the report. Chinese automakers are making big gains in Europe's electric vehicle, or EV, market. The competitive threat has led the European Union to launch an investigation into China's government support for its EV industry. The investigation adds to technology-related tensions between the West and China. At the same time, China is one of Europe's biggest trading partners and the world's biggest auto market. Chinese EV makers like Europe because auto import taxes are just 10% compared to 27.5% in the United States, automotive expert Matthias Schmidt said. Europe also has the world's second biggest EV battery market after China. Car buyers in Europe like how Chinese EVs are not costly, yet filled with features and stylish designs. Concerns about the threat to local car makers and jobs are just not as important for some European buyers who face increased living costs. British retiree John Kirkwood replaced his Volkswagen Passat three years ago with an MG5 station wagon. The MG5's price was much lower than the price of the nearest competitor, a Kia that cost thousands more. It's nice, it's quiet, it's refined, and very quick, Kirkwood said, adding that he had few concerns about the Chinese ownership of the British brand. MG is owned by Syke Motor, China's biggest automaker. Syke is the largest Chinese EV company in Europe, too. Another Chinese automaker... BYD is growing fast. Other companies with complete or partial Chinese ownership include Geely, which owns Sweden's Volvo, and a number of EV brands, including Polestar, Link and Company, and British sports car maker Lotus. Chinese EV makers' combined sales 
are a small part of the 9.2 million vehicles sold in Europe every year. But Chinese EV builders have been taking up a piece of the smaller EV market at a fast rate. Schmidt's information suggests that Chinese automakers make up only about 3% of Western Europe's total car market, but Chinese manufacturers have 8.4% of the EV market. That number is up from 6.2% last year. In 2019, it was almost zero. The sales increase is leading some to worry about Europe's automotive industry. That powerful industry is mainly centered in France and Germany and employs many workers. Last month, European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen said, Global markets are now flooded with cheaper Chinese electric cars with prices kept artificially low by huge state subsidies. A subsidy is government support that permits a company to sell products at unfairly low prices. The Commission, the EU's executive arm, officially opened its investigation this month, saying it would take up to 13 months and could result in import duties, another word for taxes. China voiced strong dissatisfaction and promised to firmly safeguard Chinese companies' rights. The Chinese Commerce Ministry said the EU investigation is based on subjective assumptions, lacks enough evidence, and goes against World Trade Organization rules. Executives at Shanghai-based Iways, a company headed by Volvo's former China sales chief, rejected accusations that the Chinese government unfairly supports its businesses. We're not selling inside China. We're not being subsidized in China, said Alexander Klose, vice president of overseas operations. Klose said his company does get some subsidies for putting a plant somewhere, but added that he believes that is what everybody has in Europe. The EU should be working on getting to a green future rather than keeping competition out, he said. I'm John Russell. Before the report, we asked you to pay careful attention to the word features. Do you remember when you heard it? You heard the word features used to describe why European buyers like Chinese EVs. Let's listen again. Car buyers in Europe like how Chinese EVs are not costly, yet filled with features and stylish designs. Feature is a noun. We make it plural by adding an S. That is how we arrive at the word features. The online etymology dictionary tells us that feature dates to the mid-14th century. It originally meant a facial characteristic. In other words, it was used to talk about a person's appearance. In the end of the 17th century, it took on the meaning of any distinctive part. In modern times, we still use it to talk about a person's face. You might hear a person described as having light features, dark features, or unusual features. But we also use features more generally to mean an interesting or important part, quality, or ability. We often use features to talk about technological devices or products. So, you might say that you like a certain mobile phone because it has nice features. What might those features be? Examples include a big screen, a nice camera, good sound, and so on. In terms of EVs, buyers might like the vehicle's features, such as battery range, fast charging time, lower maintenance cost, or built-in cameras. And that's the lesson of the day. And that's our program for today. Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Dan Novak. And I'm Dan Friedel. 